ladies and gentlemen, has everybody got their breath back? I'm sure we must have paid a very cheap rate to get up here after five flights of climbing. <laughs> So a big welcome from me and Sue Biggs, those I haven't met before, Sue Biggs, Director General of the RHS, and to everyone in this room, it's great to see so many have fought through the tube and the train strikes. We always seem to have something on this day that stops people being able to come. There was something last year, wasn't there? Uh, and to everyone online, it's really great that so many people could join us for the eighth RHS John McLeod Science Lecture. And I'm delighted to not only welcome everyone in the room, but also Professor Nicola Spence, who is a... Well, she hardly needs an introduction from me, really. Uh, it's very rare, actually, that I give welcomes like this and I bring a piece of paper up with me. And there is only one reason why I have brought the piece of paper up. It is because Nicola has so many amazing things about her. So you'll forgive me if I read a little part of this, but everybody knows Nicola, obviously, uh, DEFRA and her role at DEFRA. And speaking as the chair of the Ornamental Horticulture Roundtable Group, all of Nicola's team, uh, we couldn't do what we try and achieve at Ornamental Roundtable Group without Nicola and her team at DEFRA. So thank you very much for that, just as a kickoff. But as Chief Plant Health Officer there at DEFRA, everybody in this room knows that she's an expert in plant health and international plant trade. And certainly with Brexit, oh, look, we've got two minutes without mentioning Brexit <laughs> <laughs> coming up. That's really a skill that we, we really all need between us. But previously, Nicola was Head of Plant Health and Chief Scientist at, at VERA, the Food and Environment Research Agency. She's an experienced research scientist, and she's worked on virus diseases of horticultural crops in the UK and internationally. She's Vice President of the British Society of Plant Pathology, President of the European Foundation of Plant Pathology, Visiting Professor in Plant Pathology at Harper Adams University. We're not even halfway there yet. Uh, a member of the court at the University of York, a trustee of the Yorkshire Arboretum. She has a BSc in Botany from the University of Durham, an MSc in Microbiology from Birkbeck College, the University of London, and a PhD in Plant Virology from the University of Birmingham. I'm going to crawl out now. I've only got a degree in English. I feel <laughs> terrible. <laughs> but she really is all-round superwoman in the world of plant health, and that's why reading out that incredible list of achievements... Uh, in recognition of her talents, I think, is well-deserved. But as you all know, uh, tonight's lecture is entitled Responding to an Increasing Threat, Protecting the UK from Plant Pests and Diseases. And, you know, it really doesn't need me to tell anyone in this room about the terrifying prospect of what's awaiting on our borders and the growth in plant diseases, the pests and diseases that have grown I think it's even gone over a 1,000 now, I think, in this country. And that's shocking. Uh, we're pretty obsessed with it at the RHS because clearly for gardening, if we can't do something to help that. So for all the people in this room from the RHS, for our 16 amazing plant health scientists and everyone else here from the science committee and the science division in the RHS, I think the work that all of us in this room are doing to try and stem the problems of pests and diseases is vital if we're going to keep this wonderful, green and pleasant land that is our amazing country. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Nicola and let her speak for the next hour or whatever it is. So thank you very much, Nicola. Well, thank you, Sue, for that lovely introduction. And it's a great pleasure for me to be able to talk to you about the threat from pests and diseases. So kicking off, why is there an increasing threat? Well, it's to do with global trade, it's to do with changing climates, it's to do with the way in which people move plants and plant products around the world so rapidly. And this graph shows very clearly in the last century how there's been a dramatic increase in the number of pests and diseases arriving in the UK, uh, particularly tree pests are of great concern, but obviously plant pests uh, of great concern as well. So there is a trend here, and so it's become increasingly important that we deal with these pests and diseases, that we know what's out there, what might arrive here, where's it coming from, how can we stop that from happening, and what the impacts might be if things did arrive and how we're going to manage those problems. Because we have problems in trade, we have problems in gardens, and in the wider environment. So it's a really serious threat. So where do these threats come from? Well, there are lots of pathways 
These are the obvious pathways. Uh, plants, trees, soil, things being loaded onto Danish trolleys, things coming in the back of containers. Uh, so that's the more traditional pathway for plant pests and diseases. And obviously we've got a growing demand for mature trees, mature plants that are coming in to order on the backs of lorries. So this presents a real challenge. There's lots of plant products that we import. Some of them are for food. Uh, and here are some examples of things like um, fruit flies, thrips, etc., that arrive on fresh produce. But we've also got wood products. So here's a selection of timber, pallets, and also those are the kind of wreaths that you get in garden centres uh, for doing um, your Christmas wreaths. So we began to realise that there were all sorts of wood products that are outside the normal plant health pathways that we need to think about. And even machinery and equipment, cars, lorries, these are marmorated stink bugs. So they are a plant pest globally. They attack fruits and vegetables, but actually they're also a real nuisance because they get into people's homes and they stink. So they are known to hide in various machinery, vehicles, containers, etc. And of course, things get smuggled as well. You know, we get potatoes being smuggled with other commodities or uh, also on the right there that those are curry leaves fresh curry leaves are currently prohibited because of the risks and we find that uh, there's a real demand for those products so they do get smuggled from time to time and it doesn't just stop at plants and products even furniture obviously lots of furniture is made from wood so here are some household items where there is evidence of longhorn beetles that have been boring into those household items. You can see the exit holes. Sometimes our inspectors get involved because somebody will report um, you know, an unusual pest that's popped out of their chair uh, and they suddenly find it in their conservatory. Uh, and often these are Asian longhorn beetles and the source of these chairs and household products can be traced back to Asia. And it's very poor quality wood. It's covered with some kind of fabric. Um, people buy them on eBay. They think it's a bargain. And then they get um, a plant pest popping out. And actually then the, the chair has to be destroyed. It even happens on larger pieces of furniture. So this was a headboard. Um, and this, this family began to realize there was a sort of scratching noise in their headboard. And they couldn't work out what was happening. Um, you know, they thought there was, it was the neighbours, they thought there was some kind of infestation in the roof. And eventually, um, I think they brought the pest control people from the council round uh, and somehow plant health inspectors got involved. And sure enough, there was um, an Asian longhorn beetle boring its way through their headboard. So these kind of headlines, um, you know, are, are not, these headlines are not unexpected. Uh, people really thought that their furniture was haunted, but actually it was the boring of these beetles. It can take them up to four years to complete their life cycle in the UK. In Asia, their life cycle, life cycle can be completed in a year, so they might be sitting happily in your furniture, munching away, and then one day they'll pop out uh, and reveal themselves uh, in all their glory. So these are the kind of threats that we do get involved in. Uh, and they are real serious threats to us. Even the art world is not immune from this. I don't know if any of you went to this exhibit of Ai Weiwei's trees at the Royal Academy a couple of years ago. So actually I happened to be uh, at a meeting at the Linnaean Society next door. So I um, thought, oh, that looks interesting. I'll go and have a look, took some pictures. And then of course, because I'm a plant pathologist, I start sort of having a closer look. And sure enough, there are exit holes in this piece of art. So we got the Forestry Commission to come and do a survey and then we had to go and liaise with the Royal Academy. Uh, and in fact, what happened was this exhibit was fumigated. We had to take it down, fumigate it in, a, in an enclosed space because actually it was destined to be travelling to other European capitals because it's, it's a work of art. So that was a lesson learned for the Royal Academy and now they're looking much more closely at 
works of art, and even picture frames. You know, where have they come from? What wood has been used? Um, you probably recognise this. This is uh, the Olympic Park. Uh, and obviously, it was an important sports venue during the Olympic Games. And actually, we work really closely with the Olympic uh, Legacy Project and the Olympic Games to make sure that the planting at the Olympic Park was appropriate. We advised against planting oak trees, for example, because of oak processionary moth being present in London. So that was all fine until at the end of the Olympic Games, there was a handover to other contractors so that the, the park could be redeveloped. And then suddenly somebody decided to plant an oak tree as a work of art. So this has got some a sort of hoop in it. The idea was that this was a celestri celestial ring that was going to align with the Olympic rings at the solstice or, or some such. So a very worthy piece of public art. Unfortunately, that oak tree had oak processionary moth. So um, we discovered it just before the Tour de France was about to go through the Olympic Park, about two days before. So we were concerned because there's a health impact here, the, um, the hairs of the oak processionary moth can cause irritation. So we looked at the risk assessment and decided the risk was too great. Uh, so that's what happened to that tree, sadly. <laughs> I'm not sure what happened to the work of art, but it's just a, an example of a well-meaning, a well-intentioned uh, activity which had severe consequences from a plant health point of view. Uh, and obviously, um, you know, you'll recognise this gentleman, Jose Mourinho. He's got a lot of things to think about. He does not want to be thinking about the quality of the turf at his football pitch. He certainly does not want to be thinking about parasitic nematodes and actually we've had a problem over the last few years with many um, sports venues um, who lay turf and there's actually a really complex process to laying some of these high quality pitches so they bring in sand and underlay and and they heat them from below so that is the perfect incubator for things like nematodes, some fungi. So we got involved with quite a few football clubs and golf clubs uh, and rugby clubs over the last couple of years. Uh, I mean, actually, a football stadium is a kind of contained unit, if you like, but what we're concerned about is where are the materials coming from that might bring in the nematodes and what happens to them when the pitches are dismantled. So we've actually developed a biosecurity protocol now with all of these sports venues so that um, you know, they can better manage the turf and also when the turf is removed and they're laying a new one, the, 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 the soil is disposed of appropriately and if there is a problem it's not going to get into the wider environment. And in fact, these are some of the headlines uh, because Manchester United decided to use garlic to treat their pitch. Uh, so you can imagine that many um, tabloid newspapers had a lot of fun with that. And it wasn't just Man United. Man City had the same problem as well. So garlic's actually quite effective if you spray with garlic. It encourages the nematodes to hatch uh, and then you can actually uh, treat them and get rid of them. So that's an ongoing process, uh, and actually there's been problems in other parts of Europe, so uh, another area where we, we need to get involved and, and develop better protocols for biosecurity. <laughs> we all know that millennials love food, they love nature, and you know, they celebrate food on Instagram and all sorts of sort of new food products that they love. So here's one, it's called Ulico, and actually doesn't it look beautiful? You know, these lovely coloured tubers. They look a little bit like potatoes, but actually it's a completely different family. It's not the potato family. But we realised through our horizon scanning work, we, we, we basically scrape the internet for evidence of commodities that might have a plant health impact. Uh, and in my team, we discovered that Ulico was being promoted as a, a new food product in the UK. And actually somebody was growing it and selling it. So we thought we'd better investigate this because actually Ulico can be a host for some pests uh, of crops like potato. So sure enough, um, we went and did some inspection and we discovered uh, virus-like symptoms in the Ulico. So the plant virologists at Ferrer 
um, started investigating what might be in these Ulico, uh, and they soon realised that there was a whole range of viruses. So what you see on the left there is the output from high throughput sequencing. So they started investigating what was in the Ulico, and in the end they thought, Do you know what, we're just going to sequence everything because it's such a complex picture. And so what we drew out was several potato viruses, some viruses completely new to science. So that showed us that there was a lot of evidence that Ulico uh, was a risk. So actually that allowed us to take a data package to the European Union to say we think Ulico should be regulated. So all the other member states agreed with us and actually that's now, that's now going to happen. So we need to keep on top of this. Uh, and um, it wasn't sort of long after this whole incident when I, I like watching MasterChef and MasterChef Peru Week. Who'd have thought it? Guess what they were promoting? Ulico. So immediately that's ringing alarm bells uh, and actually we went out to the press, the media and promoted the fact that actually Ulico was no longer available in the UK uh, and it was going to be subject to regulation. So I do watch these things with interest, sort of increasing trends, you know, what's going to be next. So that's why it's really important that we do horizon scanning. And the horizon scanning we've been doing feeds into the UK Plant Health Risk Register. So this is really a unique asset that we have in the UK. Nobody else in the world's got anything quite like this. We started it in 2014 when we recognised that we really weren't assessing risks adequately. So this is a completely open, uh, downloadable database, essentially, where we manage the risks on a monthly basis. So what happens is the UK Plant Health Risk Group meets every month, and that consists of policy people, scientists, um, inspectors from all the devolved administrations of the UK, and we look at you know what's new, what's emerging, what are the things that we need to look at. So typically we look at between five and ten new risks every single month. Um, so you can imagine that um, the, the number of threats is growing. So we're, we, we reached um, a thousand pests on the risk register recently uh, and the trajectory just continues. Um, now not all of these are high risk. Some of them actually um, don't need regulation, they might need uh, an awareness campaign or they might actually need some immediate action. So it allows us to prioritise and decide what we're going to do. Uh, and then also talk to uh, industry, talk to the public and talk to our partners about it. So not all the threats are high risk, so this shows the profile. Most of the threats that we're adding now are in the kind of blue-green, lower risk category. But you can see in the kind of red, yellow, we're looking at sort of 30 or 40 uh, very high risk pests. So what do we do to manage that risk? Well, of course, we have to go and inspect material that's high risk. So this sort of shows some of the challenges that our inspectors face uh, the, from the global threat, you know, containers full of um, commodities, sometimes mixed commodities, trolleys that are wrapped, they're difficult to get into. Uh, and when you go to a nursery, you know, you've got millions of plants to look at. So we develop scientific protocols for sampling, for analysis. Uh, and sometimes we have to inspect things like steel consignments. Why, why would a plant health inspector be looking at that? Well, look what it's packed with. It's packed with wood. And actually, that's very poor quality wood. Uh, and when we look more closely, it's actually got exit holes from longhorn beetles. So that consignment was destroyed at the cost of the importer uh, and over the course of a few months you know this was very expensive um, so again that meant that we need to communicate better with other industries like the steel trade like uh, the white goods trade so that they understand that there is an international protocol for wood packaging it's called ISPN 15 and all wood should be compliant uh, otherwise it will get destroyed. So we've seen a dramatic reduction in non-compliant wood packaging of this kind, which is great to see the industry getting on board. We use all sorts of technology to try and look for pests and diseases, so everything from drones to acoustics. So in the bottom left there, that tree has got an electronic ear strapped to it, uh, and one of my colleagues is listening in 
on a device. So some pests have a very specific sound profile. This, uh, this work was actually done with the University of York. Uh, and then similarly, other pests, you can sniff them out. So there's a sniffer dog that we borrowed from Austria when we had an outbreak of Asian longhorn beetle in Kent in 2012. Those dogs are, I went to see them recently. They are quite amazing. I've got some, some other pictures of them. So there are various ways that we can actually look for pests when we can't see them. Uh, and of course, new technology is happening all the time. We're working with quite an exciting spin out from the Harwell Space Agency called Resitec. Uh, and they're developing a map for species identification of trees. And then by applying a stress layer, you know, we can actually tell which, which of those trees are under stress, which ones might be diseased. At the moment, we fly helicopters all over the UK, looking at the canopies of trees so that we can then focus where we need to go and look. But this kind of satellite technology gives us a real-time picture every single day as to what's happening, and we can build that picture up over time. And I think this big data becomes increasingly important as a tool uh, for us to monitor the health of our plants and our trees. We also have lots of lab technology, as you'd expect, so developing diagnostic techniques and also putting some of these technologies into the hands of users like our inspectors at Heathrow. They've got these little boxes, they're called genies. Um, they can actually identify two species level various diseases on produce. So that means that they can get a result in 20 minutes. They can clear the commodity or hold the commodity and um, that keeps the trade flowing. So science and technology is at the heart of our detection, our diagnosis, our surveillance and our monitoring. Uh, so it's incredibly important that we, that we work with the science base uh, and train people for the future. And of course, sometimes things become established here. This is uh, Dryocosmus, the oriental chestnut gall wasp. Uh, on the right hand side there, you can see the symptoms it causes and the pest itself. Uh, and we're actually looking at native and non-native parasitoids that might be the solution to manage this pest. We don't think we'll be able to eradicate it, but actually through exploiting a natural relationship, we hope to be able to suppress this pest over time. So this research, again, is being done by Ferrer. Of course, we have to be better prepared when there is an emergency. These are some of the headlines that appeared during the ash dieback crisis. And, you know, this really showed the public interest here is huge. Uh, so it's really important that we are prepared in the event of an incursion. And we also increasingly use volunteers and partners to help us. So this shows the observatory network of expert volunteers. They're all over the UK. We have about 200 of them. Uh, and we train them to look for not only existing pests and diseases, but future threats. And it was an observatory volunteer that found the second finding of oriental chestnut gall wasp. Um, so we train them in all of these pests, about 25 of them, uh, and we keep adding to the list. So using a combination of um, sort of one-to-one -one training webinars, we equip them to go out into the countryside and hunt down these pests. So it's actually incredibly helpful um, when we are facing a challenge, we can get our volunteers out there and try and help um, find out to what extent it's, it might be out there. These are some of the reports from our observatory volunteers. Kind of uh, red shows they found something, green shows uh, it was all clear, and then blue is for, for further investigation. So this is the kind of real-time surveillance using, using the public, which is fantastic. Um, we're also looking at using serious games to help get the message out. We're funding a student at the University of Stirling called Craig Doherty. Actually, he is um, a computer science graduate. He got a first class degree in computer science. We persuaded him to do an internship on plant health and he decided that he liked it. So then we persuaded him to do a PhD on plant health. And now he's developing some games and working with the public um, in combination with APHA and the Royal Botanic Gardens in Edinburgh. So I'm really excited to see uh, what his project's going to come up with. So you're probably wondering, so what are our sort of hot list of pests? Well, it won't be a surprise to many of you. Uh, Asian longhorn beetles I've already talked about. I mean, they are ubiquitous. 
uh, in so many plants and products, and they've got a very wide host range. We've had one outbreak in Kent, but we did manage to eradicate that, but we had to fell 2,000 trees. So it, it is a really difficult challenge. Uh, there are various outbreaks all over Europe, and this is something that you know, we absolutely have to keep out of, or get on top of very quickly. When I was in Austria a couple of weeks ago, I saw their sniffer dogs in action. So throughout Austria, there are more than 100 sniffer dogs trained, uh, and they go out with inspectors and they search pallets uh, and plant products and trees. So it's interesting that they've taken that approach. The second pest is the emerald ash borer, which is um, rather a beautiful looking pest, but it is absolutely deadly. Uh, it attacks ash trees um, like this, and it will kill them in two to four years. So that is the same street um, only a few years later in the US where all of those trees have been killed. Um, the likely pathway for this is, is actually in wood and wood products. So that is why wood is very, very um, tightly regulated and monitored. Uh, there are outbreaks of emerald ash borer in North America and Canada. There's also an outbreak in Russia. So it's really important that we manage anything coming from those countries to keep the emerald ash borer out. And then, of course, Xylella fastidiosa, which many of you will have heard about. These are the typical symptoms on olive, uh, and the heel of Italy has had a really serious outbreak of Xylella fastidiosa which they, they will not be able to eradicate. It is established there. It is vectored by the spittle bug, which we have in abundance. Uh, and it has got a very wide host range, about 350 hosts, which we have in abundance. So we've got the vector, we've got the host, we absolutely need to keep uh, the xylella out of the UK. So it's been a very, very strong focus for us in the last... A uh, couple of years. That's its worldwide distribution. So it is established in North and South America. There's an outbreak in Iran, and then we've got the European outbreaks in uh, Spain, France, Italy. Um, so this is a subject of, of kind of very close debate. Um, I worry about these kind of symptoms on oak. This is in uh, Virginia. So, you know, it really can have an impact not just on traded plants, but in trees in the wider environment. So we've had a campaign to strengthen regulations at EU level. So going back to last year, we brought in additional controls on high-risk hosts. And this year, we've brought on additional controls on Polygala myrtifolia, which is one of the hosts. And just this week, we announced new controls on olive. So you may have seen that announcement. It came out on Monday. It will come into effect from the 26th of November that we will require statutory notification of all olive. That means that we, we know what's coming in. We can check whether it's come from the, the pest-free areas that it should do. All xylella, all olives are now tested um, and certified before they're moved, but it, but it means we've got much, much closer uh, scrutiny on this material. And, and we keep a close eye on it and obviously work closely with industry. There's been a lot of voluntary action by growers and industry, which has been great to see. Really proactive businesses looking at their sourcing, making decisions uh, and signing up to the Horticultural Trades Association industry statement. It shows real commitment to work with us to try and keep this pest out. Um, and we've been targeting horticultural shows um, using the Animal and Plant Health Agency. Um, I've been doing podcasts and quite a lot of media around this to get the message out. And we're also very lucky that um, His Royal Highness takes a very keen interest in environmental matters and particularly plant health and biosecurity. So his leadership and convening power has, has brought together lots of parts of industry so that we're, you know, we're getting really serious about this and his Gardener's World broadcast um, was, was very pertinent. Also, the RHS have been very, very supportive, and they brought in a ban on high-risk hosts at Chelsea last year, uh, and again, reviewing their biosecurity protocols in their gardens, at their shows, uh, and there'll be more of that to come. So it's really good to see everyone working together increasingly. And the RHS have got, a, a, we've got a great partnership with them over some of the pests and diseases that occur in the garden. 
So things like Agibanthus gallmidge, um, the honey fungus that many gardeners will recognise, uh, box blight, and also rose rosette virus, which is not in the UK. We've got a PhD project with the RHS. So working together, you know, using the science expertise of the RHS together with um, all the universities that want to engage in this means that we can get the knowledge, we can get the expertise, uh, and try and keep that problem at bay. Um, last year, we had an exhibit at Chelsea called Action Oak, which is a new partnership bringing together organisations, government and charitable organisations who want to do more to protect the health of our oak trees. So the exhibit was, was fantastic. We won a gold medal. We got lots of media interest, lots of political interest, as well as uh, members of the public coming and telling us how much they love oak trees. So we are really determined to generate considerable research funding so that we can be on the front foot with oak health. You know, we don't want the situation like uh, Dutch elm disease, ash dieback. Um, so this is a long-term project um, and we're already funding work in several universities on things like acute oak decline, oak processionary moth. Uh, all of this information we promote through the UK Plant Health Portal. So if you want to sign up for that, you'll get uh, all the latest information about xylella, you'll get the latest information about new pests and diseases and new uh, pest risk analyses. And we've had a campaign this summer, again aimed at the public, uh, basically saying, please don't bring back things from your holidays, don't risk it, don't risk bringing in something that could then have an impact on the industry, on the, the sort of gardening sector, or indeed in the, on the wider environment. And then finally, I also tweet about things like this, so um, give me a follow, and um, there's always lots of information about what's happening with plant health. So, that's all from me, but I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Right, so I'm the Director of Science and Collections for, for the Royal Horde of Science. <coughs> I'm fielding the questions and we've, we've had some students uh, who have got microphones to roam in. So, who's got a question? Very enjoyable talk. Um, Nicola, do you think that the threat from casual tourists that you put up at the end is bigger, smaller, or just a general part of this sort of risk of introduction of new pests and diseases? Well, we don't have a strong evidence base, I think it's fair to say. However, we do have anecdotal evidence that the fuchsia gall midge that we have now established in the southwest probably came from fuchsia fanciers that went on holiday, brought things back um, en route via the Channel Islands. Uh, I think, you know, possibly Agipanthus gormage. I think, you know, we, we've got a sense that some of these problems could be caused by people that, you know, are unwittingly thinking, oh, that's a nice specimen, I'll bring that back, and I like collecting things, not realising what the impact might be. So um, the regulations around passenger baggage are quite complex. It's something that um, you know, we want to review um, and strengthen. Uh, so we feel that actually a message saying, um, you know, if you're bringing something back, you really don't know what's in it and you wouldn't want to be the one that caused a problem. Um, we do um, sometimes work with Border Force on their sort of passenger channel and go and have a look and see what's in baggage that they've pulled for other reasons. And, you know, we do sometimes find regulated plant products like potatoes. I mean, some people actually do smuggle potatoes in their luggage because it's a variety that they like from where they come from. So, you know, potatoes are absolutely forbidden. Uh, but I think, you know, we need to make it clearer to the public what their obligations are, what the risks are, and work together to, to manage this. Obviously, other countries have... Uh, a different approach. They have an absolutely zero tolerance. So, you know, that is something that we need to think about. So do you, do you think we might end up with a sort of Australia-style uh, set of regulations on import? Well, I think it's something that people are talking about. Um, I think it's something we need to have a debate about. Um, and, um, you know, there are consequences to that. 
obviously it, it creates a culture of biosecurity, which I think would be really helpful because if you're a New Zealander or from Australia, you know, you grow up with that knowledge that you are protecting your primary industries, your natural habitat, uh, and every citizen has a responsibility for that. So I think that's something that, that we do need a public debate about. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, my name's Graham Spencer. Uh, given that you that we can probably anticipate uh, more work for them following what's happening in March next year, and given that effective regulation helps to facilitate pest and disease-free trade, do you think Animal and Plant Health Agency is adequately resourced? So we've been working on what the requirements might be in the event of a no-deal scenario or if there is a negotiated settlement. And in anticipation of that, we have been recruiting additional plant health and seeds inspectors. So we already have recruited around about 50 uh, and we're advertising at the moment. So we think we may need around about 100 extra inspectors. So they're coming on board, we're training them. We're also looking at um, you know, what resource we've already got in the service so that we can be ready in the event, in the unlikely event of a no deal scenario um, to deal with that from day one. So that is a, an absolute priority at the moment. And again, working with industry, we've issued a technical notice about this and also working with industry bodies. Um, we are you know, talking to them about what some of the, the issues might be, how we can help them prepare in the event of a no-deal scenario. But you know, certainly in terms of resourcing in the Animal and Plant Health Agency, we will have those extra inspectors on board. Hello, Simon Toomer from the National Trust. Um, we operate a plant health standard across our gardens and parks, and you're probably aware we have over 200 gardens. Um, one of the things uh, I get, one of, one, of the, one of the standards, or one of the elements within that standard is vigilance about plant suppliers, plant nurseries. And one of the things I get asked a lot from gardens and, and park managers is, you know, what, what should we be looking for? How do we go about doing that? Should we visit? Should we, you know, what should we ask? And I just wonder what would help them greatly would be some sort of accreditation scheme. And I know we, we talked about this before, but do you think we're getting towards that now for, for nurseries and suppliers? Yes, I mean, I'm really pleased to say that that idea has really gained a lot of momentum and particularly working through an alliance of industry partners and uh, partners in the voluntary sector um, we are now uh, developing a biosecurity standard. Uh, so the, uh, the Plant Health and Biosecurity Alliance, which has been convened um, sort of since uh, earlier this year, and it's chaired by Sir Nicholas Bacon, the president of the RHS, um, we are now getting towards um, a draft standard that we're going to consider and then work together with the Horticultural Trades Association to come up with an accreditation scheme for that. So that is something that we're determined to do um, and it's actually progressing very, very well. So there'll be more about that a, a bit later on in the year um, and I think we're hoping to announce something early next year. Um, and it will be something that everybody could sign up to, whether you're you know, working in uh, the kind of horticultural se sector, um, forest reproductive material, um, a garden, a, a trust, etc. If we've all got a, a single biosecurity standard that we can sign up to, and then we can actually be accredited against that standard uh, at that garden, in that business, uh, so that we can have a lot more confidence. And I think then we need to communicate that to the public so that they understand that if something is uh, grown to a biosecurity standard, or you know, imported plants as well, uh, if they are meeting the biosecurity standard, uh, then that means you know you can you can safely procure them, and we in government would like to see that as part of government procurement as well, so that um, you know that drives good behaviour in all the sectors that we're working with, um, and it means that if you if you don't meet the standard, then you know it's going to be more difficult for you to trade if if people don't have confidence in your product. So I think it's all about building confidence in supply chains, building confidence in the product, making it very clear 
who meets the standard, and then communicating that to the public and to buyers and purchasers so that they understand. And also garden designers would, would like to be able to do that because you know, they're, they're creating a, a beautiful design. Uh, they want the um, company that's providing their plants to be accredited, to meet the standard so that they don't have some unintended consequence of, of a plant that they've specified. Uh, my name's David Ebbles, and it, I'm long since retired, so I'm probably very out of date. But you haven't actually mentioned plant passporting as such. Uh, and I wonder if this is long since um, uh, su um, superseded or uh, whether it is still current, and also uh, what may happen to it after Brexit. So passporting is very much alive and well um, so you know we operate an EU system for plant passporting high-risk plants so that is very current um, in the event of a no deal um, we would likely lose access to that system but we feel that it's such a useful system for traceability that we're proposing to introduce a national passporting system uh, so that when material arrives into the UK um, it comes with a phytosanitary certificate from the country of origin, um, which we can check, we can do any inspections, and then it becomes uh, part of our national passporting system. So then that means we've got full traceability. And again, we're talking to industry about the practicalities of how that might work. So it's a system that you know, we do feel has, has got tremendous value and we want to keep. Thank you. Just to follow up on the, the comments about accrediting and standards, I have heard it discussed by some nurseries that there's a cost of meeting these sorts of standards. Are they likely to be compulsory or is the intention to be an encouragement that other people when they purchase will be prepared to pay a little bit extra? Well, I think what we're working on is uh, a scheme that is essentially developed through partnership. But you're right, if you're going to be accredited against the standard, there is a cost to that. Um, you know, we haven't worked out the details and, and the sort of plan around that. Uh, but I would also say that what is the cost of getting it wrong in terms of your business, your supply chain, the confidence in your customers? Of course, we've got to, um, you know, manage the costs of that. Uh, but also that's why it's important to communicate with the public about what is, what is the real value of what you're buying. Uh, and if, you're, if you've got something uh, that has high biosecurity value, then you know, will people recognize that and will they be able to, to bear the cost of that? But I would hope that the system, you know, if it works well, then you know, I hope that businesses can be more efficient, they can manage risk better, you know, that they can produce more product in the UK so that they're not having to import and having that additional concern. So I think a standard will help improve um, business behaviour and biosecurity behaviour to manage better the, the risk in the business. So, uh, you know, I think it'd be interesting to see how the kind of business model for that uh, works out. But it's still very much early days. Following that from a consumer point of view, does that mean that um, purchasing plants directly on the internet would have to stop? Because if the uh, trade is uh, working towards a, a, um, a standard, which sounds obviously a very good, sensible idea, what about individual people buying their own plants? Bring all plant traders into line. Uh, so that would bring internet traders people doing direct sales um, into the same legislative framework. So, you know, they would be um, subject to all the same plant health regulations. I mean, I think we do recognize that, um, you know, there are many very good internet trading businesses who are following, um, you know, good biosecurity. So it's not the case that, um, you know, everybody's, um, you know, got low biosecurity but but you know we we are 
spending a lot of time and effort, you know, trying to work out, you know, what's being traded, where's it coming from. We work with Amazon, eBay, etc. We've got several key words. If they show up, then they will inform us and that trader gets cut off. So there is a way of actually enforcing it now, um, but, you know, it takes a lot of resource. So our intention is to bring everybody into line with the same set of regulations and then um, make sure we can enforce it. Hi, um, there's a question here from somebody watching the live stream on Facebook. Uh, I'm not sure where she is, but uh, Linda Grushi, is there a biosecurity risk from growing things like pips and stones from imported fruit, e.g. avocado and oranges? Well, of course, seeds can transmit pests and diseases. Um, particularly, you know, there are some viruses which are seed-borne, some other pathogens can be on the, the outside of the seed. So again, um, you know, some seeds are, are higher risk than others, uh, but, you know, my advice would be don't risk it, um, or if you want to import seeds, you need to get the advice from the plant health service in the country um, where, you, where you reside. And, and get permission and maybe a phytosanitary certificate. So seed is heavily regulated because it is high risk. No, th is those are actually quite well. These are actually risks. They're not things that are here. It's when we do our horizon scanning and we look globally to to see what possible threats there might be, uh, and then we assess them, we evaluate them. So mostly they're threats that do not occur here, uh, but we want to have a good assessment as to what what's the likelihood that they might arrive, how might that happen, and what are we going to do about it. So it's really a tool for managing risk. Um, and I think it's just, um, you know, a process that we have to go through to try and capture all the risks out there. And, of course, there are very many. Um, so, you know, we, on the one hand, yes, it's alarming that there are so many potential pests and diseases uh, that might arrive here. But I think uh, it, it allows us to prioritise the action that we're going to take and better deal with them uh, if they do arrive. Last question. So flowers that are coming from abroad are, are regulated. So if they're coming <coughs> from outside the EU, um, you know, a lot of them are air freighted directly into Heathrow. We've got a team of inspectors that inspect them. Obviously, some material comes through Holland. It comes through the Dutch flower markets. Uh, but you know, some flowers are higher risk than others. Certainly, um, we have a risk base uh, for inspecting sort of high-risk plants. You know, we're particularly concerned about things like white flies um, and other insects. But, you know, there are some diseases of foliage. And again, you know, we add them to the risk register and then we will take a risk-based approach to inspect them. Great. Um, thank you. Thank you very much, Nicola. I think um, I can say that you're doing an excellent job. I know it's a tough job. And I think certainly working with the industry and certainly a couple of reports that have recently come out as well, um, one by the Parliament, the All Party Parliamentary Gardening and Horticultural Group, <coughs> and the other one linked to the Oxford Economic Report, have both highlighted the risks of uh, plant health, but also the opportunities uh, in, relation, in relation to those. So thank you very much.